I'm trying to think if there was a moment where I thought of my, that I had some gift of communication. It was, what's interesting is because I was so shy growing up, the worst fear I had was having to speak in front of a lot of people. Uh, so that sort of knocked it out of me. You know, I, I, I knew I had thoughts, but people couldn't get over, you know, that I sounded like a girl, as, as they would put it. So I just sort of didn't like to have to speak in front of a lot of people. Now, my closest friends, I had a lot to say to. Um, you know, what I did know is, I say it like this, that I could listen with both ears. You know, that I could process information and, and people and what they were saying, and I could understand the two juxtaposing issues. I'm saying that in a very sort of um, wordy way, uh, but let's go to something. I always <laughs> wanted to be the boss of the clubhouse. So we would take you know scraps of wood and we would make a clubhouse, usually in my yard, um, somewhere by the tree or whatever. And it had to have a structure in terms of, 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 of my friends. So usually I had to be the boss, and then, and then there was somebody just there, and then there was somebody, you know, it was all this. I had a whole cabinet going, you know. And then there came a time where, where, where the, the, my friends started to bulk at the fact that I always needed to be the boss. Um, and so I sensed, you know, that I was going to be overthrown. So I knew how to, to sense what was really what were they really angry about? Then I realized it was the term boss. So then I, I chatted enough to get everybody thinking that it should be captain. <laughs> Telling this is true. So, so then, you, you know, the language is soft, it's captain, and then I had co-captain. And I did have a chauffeur that would push me in a shopping cart around. <laughs> Neighborhood. I'm not. I can't make this stuff up. Um, but it was because I could understand, you know, what people were thinking and what they were perceiving, and then maybe how to change the language. That's the same thing what happens to me when I'm speaking uh, to an audience. There is always that sense of assessing. You know, um, is this a relaxed audience? Um, is, is this an audience that's more reserved? So don't press the gas too fast because you know, they're not they're gonna come along with you. Um, how long you should speak. That you learn making dances. You know, how long can you hold someone's focus with a certain gesture, a certain movement before you need to sort of let it go? You know what I mean? When have you made your point and now you need to move on. But all that ha kind of assessing stuff happened for me when I was a child. The other thing I can remember is a big moment for me, as, as Oprah would say, an aha moment. Growing up in church, I mean, a lot of times the kids felt sort of forced to go. We didn't really understand. Uh, my fun at church was crawling underneath the pews, you know. That was like a whole underground tunnel under there of fun to be had of crawling <laughs> under the pews and disappearing. Um, one day, the presiding elder came to the church, and he was one of those preachers um, that I always talk about who had that sing-song equality, you know, that, that, that like in Awakenings, he could sort of just, you know, um, sort of... Um, just grab everyone, um, and he was preaching. And I sat on the front row watching him, and he started, he would jump from one side, uh, he jumped over the banister, the railing, um, when he was preaching. I mean, it was all this movement and intensity, and I remember just, I couldn't uh, blink my eyes, and at the end, I was uh, teary, sort of crying, not, you know, big, just, just that I was so moved. My great uncle used to tape the service all the time with his little tiny tape recorder so he could replay it at night before he went to bed. I got a hold of the tape and I would learn the sermon and I would try to sound like the preacher, I would imitate. And I would set it up in the back room 
I got a stool, this black stool that we had, the family Bible. I would go to the verse that he was reading from, and I would do the entire sermon. And I would pretend to have a congregation that I was speaking to. I would even, I mean, I was a one-man band. I would take collection as well <laughs> from nobody. <laughs> I mean, I, I've been working toward this job for a long time. <laughs> but that, that, the idea of that really um, captured my imagination. I wanted to be like that. In fact, I had, and I had a robe too, because you know, you, from what I knew, you couldn't be a preacher without a robe. So I had a little tiny bathrobe that I would put on, and I would do this whole thing. I think that's when I knew that I at least had um, some sort of um, desire to do that. Um, but it was very much later when I had a sense that, that I could speak to and in front of people and still maintain a sense of it feeling personal um, and not uh, speechy, as I would like to say.